This episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Loctite Tight Foam. Say no to inefficient and drafty. Say yes to Loctite Tight Foam. When pros need to seal gaps too small for insulation, but big enough to create a draft, they reach for Loctite's Tight Foam. The high-density foam forms a tenacious bond to most common building materials, stays flexible to prevent cracking, and keeps air, moisture, and pests out of the house. Whether you're adding R value to the rec room or finishing a boring basement, give that space a second chance with Loctite Tight Foam. Visit LoctiteProducts.com for more information. Hey, podcast listeners, be sure to check out Fine Home Building's e-learning opportunities. We've created a special discount coupon just for you. Learn about sustainable home building, using mini split heat pumps, insulation, finished carpentry, and more. See all of what's available at courses.finehomebuilding.com and then use the special code PODCAST20 for a discount on any class. That's PODCAST20 in all caps. Thanks for listening. My house was 1,100 square feet, built in 2002, and it was over 3,100 CFM 50. That's bananas. That was, well, there were no bananas could fit through the hole. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by special guest, Engineer Mike Mark Rosenbaum. Fine Home Building Senior Editor Brian Pontalillo. And Senior Producer Jeff Rose. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcasts. Well, it is a pleasure to see you gentlemen this morning. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, good morning. Happy to be here. So folks who are listening to this show with some regularity are going to be uh, pleased and surprised to know that we have a special guest. And it is my delight to introduce Mark Rosenbaum. Uh, Mark's an engineer who lives on Martha's Vineyard. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, well, I'm a building geek. Um, and uh, one of the things I like to say is I'm a, I'm a compulsive measurer of things. So uh, uh, usually when I talk about something, I have measured it. And I have actual evidence and data. And that's very rare in our field. So I think that's a distinguishing factor. Um, I started a company called Energy Smiths uh, with a friend in 1978, 79. We were both working at a consulting engineering company, high-tech engineering company. And so I've been at this for almost 45 years. Um, I would describe myself as a um, high-performance environmental building consultant. And I work uh, mostly with design and construction professionals on behalf of clients, sometimes for clients directly. And I'm looking at the thermal enclosure of buildings, the building systems, renewables. And the aim is creating just wonderful places for people. But th those places are safe and healthy, comfortable, durable, and resource efficient. And... Um, looking at all those things in an integrated fashion as opposed to parceling it out as we do amongst different design um, professionals. Uh, so in a way, what, one of my flippant ways of describing what I've done, particularly in larger buildings, because I realize you guys are focused on homes, but I've worked on, on much larger buildings, is that um, I shouldn't have a job. Uh, if, if, if design teams and construction professionals were really doing their job, they'd be considering all these things together, but they're not. So um, I have a niche that I can fill. I think um, we could all agree that uh, if people built the right way, none of us would have jobs. So I think we should thank them uh, in turn uh, for that. Um, Brian, have you met Mark before? 
Well, um, I think, Mark, we spoke a, a while back. Um, I, I don't remember, even remember why, but sometime in my time at Fine Home Building, we spoke about about something. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with you, and um, I'm going to interrupt a lot because I know Patrick has a lot of questions he wants to ask you, um, and I don't have any plan, but you're going to say a lot of things that are going to be curious to me. So, Patrick, can I ask Mark a question? <laughs> that's why you're here brian okay i guess good. i guess so <laughs> so mark you, you mentioned that you love to measure things and that we are working in, in in an industry that doesn't maybe do enough measuring um are there some on a real kind of average builderly level are there some common things that we're missing an opportunity to measure and quantify in our work well so so that's an interesting question because um from a builder's perspective, um, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that from the builder's perspective. Um, I like to know when a building starts up, particularly the first year, I like to have some some data being collected, temperatures, energy use, if it's um, not a, just a house, um, carbon dioxide levels, you know, is the ventilation system working? Um, and when you do that, you can see what's going on in a building and you can figure out if there are things that aren't working properly. Um, one that I think that might be more relevant for builders is that um, if you're in areas with radon, um, radon monitors should go in. And the the standard real estate test where they put in a radon detector for, for 20, uh, 48 hours, that's so, so nonsense. It's so crazy because radon levels vary a huge amount. Over you time. mentioned in a recent presentation at the Building Science Corporation's uh, annual summer camp that you've been checking uh, radon levels, and you found that they go up after a heavy rain, even. Yeah. 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 And and, uh, and and so so basically, I think what happens is the ground gets saturated, and radon that would normally be just coming out of the ground is is now concentrating. Um, and therefore the radon pressure, the amount of radon around the foundation's higher. That's interesting. So Mark, what would that mean to someone living in a house who's, who's constantly measuring radon levels? Would it mean that they had maybe a system where their fan was on a switch and they turned it on, turned on the fan when no, the levels I think, went up? Or? So, 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 um, a project that I've been working on that's taken forever to build, you know, COVID, everybody knows what was happened during COVID and, and it was a complicated, expensive house. Uh, it's just about to be occupied. They're uh, they're moving in, and I suggested to the builder that they put a radon monitor in that house because it's built into a hillside. The bottom level is mostly finished. You know, I have highish, uh, higher than I'd like radon levels in my basement. I don't live in my basement, mm -hmm. and and my first floor. It's a one story house. The radon levels are perfectly acceptable. So I'd like. I'd like a monitor to be in there for a month or two when the windows are closed to just see, do we have a problem? Oh, I see. You know, and, and in places where radon is an issue, um, we hope that there's some thought during the design of a house and the construction that there's some way to mitigate it if necessary. So I think every house in a place where there's radon, uh, after a major remodel, new construction, they should get a few months of radon measuring. Yeah. For what about CO, Mark? Is that a is that a concern? Are the normal I don't, carbon, CO detectors? Carbon monoxide? CO is yeah. carbon monoxide. Um, I don't know because I don't put stuff that burns in houses anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what about the things that they sell us to monitor uh, our houses for folks who do have uh, uh, combustion appliances in there? Are they accurate enough? Is that a good Good I, I think for, for carbon monoxide, they they're sure, they sure are. They usually have alarms at, you know, I think it's 30 parts per million. It's not something I know a lot about. Yeah. Yeah. Th I mean, I think that's that's code. If you've got if you've got combustion, you've got to have uh, CO detectors and they're tied in with the smokes. So, um, yeah, that I mean, I think. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I have any. I think mine must have CO also. I just don't have um, – I have a wood stove, but it's not something I use much. Mark, do you have a recommendation for um, – because I'm sure we're going to talk about a, a lot of stuff 
beyond uh, indoor air quality. Do you have a, do you do you have any uh, recommendations for indoor air quality monitors that you think are that work well? And um, I it's not, it's not something that I have followed um, closely. Uh, I went to a presentation. I think it was at one of the Passive House conferences. So this is a few years ago, and it was from someone from a professional a company that does professional monitoring around the world. Like the, so their biggest client base is, is China, actually. And uh, he categorically said that if you're if you're not paying at least five hundred dollars for like a VOC monitor or something, you're getting junk. Now mm. I don't know if that's true, so don't quote me on that. But um, I haven't been willing to spend a lot of money on VOC monitors. Uh, again, to some extent, what we're really aiming at is let's not put stuff in buildings that mm -hmm. require us to have VOC monitors, right? Let's look at the building materials as we're doing uh, design for, for buildings or renovations. Mm. So, um, Patrick, you asked me uh, some questions about um, – how I got into this work. And um, one of the things that's, that I think is kind of interesting about how I fell into this, because there certainly wasn't a very clear path. I went to college um, because I was a motorhead as a kid, like particularly with motorcycles, you know, and I worked at a gas station and we had a drag racer and, you know, that it just was like totally into that stuff. So I went to MIT because MIT had this amazing program on engines. And actually, one of my one of my uh, fellow students, a friend, uh, became the director of engineering at Cummins Diesel. Um, cool. Who, who, un <laughs> unlike Volkswagen, actually did stuff to to, to address diesel emissions. Um, but at MIT, I learned, you know, there just was all this stuff going on. It was such a great place to be. And I did some solar energy research for a professor who had some patents on some clever. Uh, things that he was hoping would would make it into buildings never did is still at it in his 80s i'm still in touch with him it's so so interesting i built um the world's lightest bike for my bachelor's thesis because i also you know i was a motorhead but i was also a two wait a minute husband. wait a minute the the world's largest bike lightest lightest out of what material well so this was the seven early 70s um not carbon fiber right um, it was the first sort of large diameter, uh, aluminum tube bike. And, you know, I built the frame and I built the pedals and the hubs and built a bunch of bits and it's, it's in the MIT museum. Um, that is impossibly cool. So you beat Cannondale to the, uh, big aluminum tube bicycle frame business. Oh yeah. I mean, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole story, which is not for this podcast about Cannondale, um, being sued by Klein bicycles for copy uh patent infringement and i got subpoenaed in that case and um the basic question the patent examiner asked klein over seven years is but wait a minute there's already a bike like this that's called that's prior art that was published in 1974 why is your bike novel it's really a whole that's that's a whole story we got to do that but, special podcast but, and i don't know anyway, if it's for fine anyways, home building but <laughs> Anyways, um, you know, I also had this sort of back to the land um, thing. I, I had spent some days up with Helen and Scott Nearing in Maine, who wrote Living the Good Life. And I was kind of a thorough enthusiast as a kid and because I grew up near Concord. Right. And so uh, I bought this piece of land in New Hampshire when I got out of graduate school and um, I wanted to uh, be off the grid, which back then didn't necessarily mean you have electricity. Um, but I said to myself, you know, I'm lazy. Even as a young person, I was lazy. Uh, I don't want to burn too much wood. So I said to myself, I'm going to build a small house. It really was a very small house, but I'm going to no more than one quart of wood. And then I did the math. I'd never built anything. I never even built a dog house, right? I did the math about what you needed to do to build a house that used only one quart of wood in central New Hampshire. And so I built a super insulated house before that, that word was probably coined. And uh, with no thermal bridges, I understood, you know, I'm an engineer, right? So I had the basic education, no thermal bridges. It was airtight, you know, taped air barrier. Um, and then windows were really bad. The best window you could get was just double glazed. 
And so I built windows. I took an adult ed shop class and I built a bunch of windows in that class that were just fixed windows. And they had ventilating flaps that were, you know, had two inches of polyiso foam in them. So the windows were fixed and I made them out of uh, two layers of glass and four layers of optically clear mylar suspended in between. So I had like R5 windows back when windows were R2. Um, and so, you know, that's, and then, and then people, and I had a solar and wood fired hot water system, passive, uh, solar and wood fired hot water and a little solar greenhouse. And I had a little, one of the very first, um, heat recovery ventilators, the little Mitsubishi that went through the wall. Um, this is, you know, 79. Uh, so was your house and, successful? Were, were you freezing to death in the winter time? Were you able oh, to heat with no, a single? No. And the house, I, I was on this sort of north slope. So the house was on, was on posts. And, um, but the floor was, was R40. And so the floor was warmer than the floor in any of my friends' houses over basements. Yeah. Well, so, I, I want to talk more about your houses uh, in the podcast after show, um, because I think it's fair to say you you practice what you preach. Not only are you helping folks uh, reduce their energy uh, consumption in buildings and getting them to where they were supposed to be in the design phase, uh, but you've, you've done this yourself. So we're going to save that conversation for the after show. Um, so I, what do you I think about one, our... I want to say one thing ahead. about that. One of the, one of the things that is is really interesting about not just our field, our industry, is that so many people tell you what to do without doing it themselves. Mm. <laughs> I have so many questions. Oh my god! Um, <laughs> so we're trying to do a better job in this country. I think it's fair to say. What do you think about the re recent efforts, namely the Inflation Reduction Act, to encourage homeowners to electrify their space heating and domestic hot water heating? Is is it is it is it the right approach? Are we are we going about it the right way? So that's a really good question, and I think it's a complex answer. Um, one of the things that it's it's really clear that if you're using propane or oil or natural gas. You're not going to make those lower carbon. You know, when you when you burn a therm of natural gas, you're going to get a certain amount of carbon emissions. That's just the way it is. Electricity, you can keep making the grid cleaner and cleaner and cleaner by adding in renewables. But, and this is a, a big one, um, the grid isn't really prepared to take massive amounts of renewables. And you can see that most clearly in California. Um, and it's what's called the duck curve. It's it's the curve of 24-hour demand uh, for electricity in California. And the penetration of solar, particularly, but wind also, but solar renewables, means that during a sunny day, the demand from the grid goes way down. And at the end of the day, when the sun is no longer making a lot of power, but it's still hot, so the air conditioners are still running, they have to, I saw one graph from a couple of years ago where they have to bring on like 11 gigawatts of power in three hours. So that's the equivalent of starting up 11 big nuclear power plants from zero to full, hmm. right? It's, it's a ridiculous ask of the grid. So the idea that we can just electrify all of our buildings and transportation and that magically the emissions go away, but that the grid can handle it is wrong. And so, um, so from the first point of view, uh, the, the way you decarbonize buildings is a three-legged stool. You have to reduce the load and that's both enclosure, that's that's both heating and cooling, and it's the loads inside that are already electrical, and it's hot water. So you have to reduce those loads. So I'm going to just call that first leg of the stool load reduction. And then systems change it, so you get the fossil fuels out of there. 
And that's typically going to be heat pumps. And we can talk about that in more detail. And in a typical American house, that also means dealing with lighting, dealing with a better, you know, all the appliances get better, you know, so they're, they're, they're more efficient. And then the third thing is renewables. And not every house is going to be a good candidate for putting PV on. Some of them are shaded. There's all kinds of reasons why. So that happens both on an individual level and a grid level. But you have to look at all three. And if you just decide that I'm going to just change all houses to heat pumps and PVs, you're not going to get there. So what 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 should we be doing if we can't just all decide to switch to heat pumps to decarbonize? Our- so 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 I think what we should be doing is is multiple things. And, and we need we need societal agreement. And we don't even have a speaker of the house. So, so, so the, now we're into fantasy land. Okay, um, we need societal agreement that we're going to deal with the grid um, and make it much more robust. And we need to understand how we reduce loads across the whole country and how we load shift. You know, so. Um, I'm in another two or three weeks, I'm going to Houston for the annual Passive House Conference, and I'm going to do a mini keynote. They have a, a few mini keynotes, mini keynote with um, Al Mitchell of FIAS, um, uh based on something that I did at uh, the Nessie Conference this year, um, which I think people were a little confused by, which is uh, you can store energy in batteries. You can store electricity in batteries, like everybody kind of gets that, right? but you can store energy in buildings thermally. And we did a lot of that 40 years ago in past with solar buildings, but the ways that you can store energy in buildings is, is pretty broad. And I actually, I actually presented a taxonomy of, of building thermal storage uh, in that talk, which I'm gonna show at FIAS 2 and build on it. And you can either store heat or you can store cool as ice, right? So. We're, this this year's conference is going to be in Houston. So think about you've got uh, excess PV energy during the day on your building. You're in Houston, humid, hot, miserable climate. Humans shouldn't live there. And um, <laughs> it's only there because of oil, right? Some, someone, an oil, uh, an, a NASA and oil engineer guy uh, who I knew uh, when I went to Houston the first time in the 90s said, this this city only exists because of oil. Otherwise, no one should live here. Um, so um, historically, engineers have used ice storage as a way to use cheap off-peak electricity at night to, to build cooling capacity for the next day. But maybe it makes sense that we should be making ice during the day with excess PV and have that carry us into those early evening hours when the grid is getting this huge demand because the cooling load is still there. And one of the uh, things that, and I haven't done any of this math, this is all just thinking about, uh, cause I'm a heating climate person, but I'm gonna go to Houston, you know, for this conference. So- In the winter. I think about, I think about <laughs> heating, what's that? In the winter. <laughs> In the winter, yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm no, nobody's fool <laughs> about that. So, um, you know, I typically think of thermal storage as um, heat. But uh, if you did ice storage in Houston, then one of the cool things about that, so to speak, is that Houston's really humid. And as our buildings get better, and this is true of houses or bigger buildings, we're getting better and better at reducing the sensible heating load, you know, the just the temperature, because the glass is, is better at rejecting solar heat and the lighting has gone to LEDs and everything we're doing is reducing the sensible load of buildings, but the, the latent load, the moisture that people give off their plants and cooking and that's in the outdoor air that we use for ventilation, that isn't changing. So that it's getting harder for air conditioning to do its job. Well, if you've got something as cold as ice water, you can do a really good job dehumidifying a building. So there may actually be um, allied 
uh, synergistic effects of, of using ice storage in buildings in humid, hot, humid climates that also help the grid. And, and those kind, that kind of thinking, um, I'm not hearing that thinking anywhere, right? And, uh, that, and there may be people in national labs thinking about that or something, but the connection between researchers and practice is so tenuous in this country um, that it could take decades to, to get there. So I think we have to th think about how we're going to fix the buildings we have. That's, that's such a key thing and how we should build new buildings properly. And I'm going to, I'm going to riff off of that for a minute because one of your questions about was that you sent to me to kind of make me think is, um, if I could wave a magic wand, what would I do to improve our built environment? And my answer to that is, Get people into the trades and stop mm. trying to send everybody to college, half of whom don't even want to be there and don't know why they're there. And uh, we just don't have a great way of, of putting people into the trades. And we need just armies of people to fix our buildings. And one of the great things about fixing our buildings and that whole body of work that's in front of us is that. It's not going to be outsourced to, to a call center in Asia. You know, you're not going to get your air sealing done from a call center in Asia. It's not going to be outsourced to chat GPT, right? It takes humans. And yeah. so until there are robots that go around in our attics and air seal them, and uh, I'm not going to live long enough to see that. Um, it's These are jobs for people. And... Uh, it's it's a whole mindset that has to change in our country. One of my dear colleagues uh, who came to work with me uh, 12, I think 12 years ago when I was at South Mountain Company uh, is a French guy who was trained in their elite trades program called the Compagnon, Compagnon de Devoir. And he's a better engineer than 99% of the engineers I've ever worked with. And he can build and fix anything. And he went to school, Patrick, for eight years, classroom and hands-on. We don't have anything like that. And in order to really do that, we have a, a real social hurdle, which is we have to make job sites and the whole design and construction industry welcoming, not hostile, to women and to non-white people. Because uh, it's really hard for um, someone who doesn't fit the mold of the white guy, you know, with his lunch pail uh, to to have a career in the building trades. Why do you think the building industry has been so hostile to these other populations? Why, why have we been excluding people? I don't know. People see it as a threat. I mean, you tell me. I'm not a social scientist. Um, <laughs> why? Why is there racism? Why is there misogyny? Why? Why do we have this like ridiculous um, witch hunt about people who are transgender? You know, like how does how does it if if someone next to me is working and doing the job and they're transgender, why would I care mm -hmm. about that? Why is that a problem for me? I mean, that's not what the podcast is about. I understand. <laughs> but if you really ask me about the magic wand, it's like get people the good jobs that we have. This, these would be good jobs because, you know, when I did the renovation of this house, the people who were paid the lowest were the carpenters, right? And so the trade programs that we have that are most prevalent in the U.S. are carpentry. But who makes more money? The HVAC and refrigeration techs, the plumbers, the electricians, and we need armies of those people. Right? Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, you know, I'm curious, um, Mark, to kind of just step step back a little bit to um, talking about retrofitting uh, the existing houses that we have, and and also the. Um, you know, the incentives that, that we can we can get to apply to houses from, you know, the federal programs and state programs and whatnot. And sometimes I get um, a little 
concerned that maybe these incentives push us th- towards um, things that aren't necessarily the, the the maybe the first steps we should be taking or the necessarily the most helpful steps. So for, just for example, you can get a tax credit on a new um, you know heating cooling plant for your house right now, but is that really where you should be spending your money first? Um, if you have a house that needs you know the attic to be air sealed, and so it sort of leads me to the question like you know, how much of an impact could we have just tackling the low hanging fruit? I mean, we can go around, you know, so many parts of the country and go into nearly every house that just needs some people who know how to get up in the attic and do some basic air sealing and insulating. So, you know, how much of an impact can we make? And should we be really focused on this sort of this sort of low hanging fruit with our existing buildings? I to- yeah, I mean, that we see eye to eye. That's the Air, air sealing is the cheapest, fastest payback, but you have to know how to do it, and you have to know where to look. Uh, so you have to understand building science and building dynamics. And um, when you do that, uh, you become more efficient at that job. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I had a, when I moved here, I bought a house in in uh, the island co housing. And those are sort of circa 2000, pretty good houses. Um, and I wasn't, so, you know, good quality finish inside and out in perfect condition. You know, at the time I moved there, it was like 10 or 11 years old house. I'm not going to wrap that house in insulation, but it's just two by six walls, you know, and, and two by 10 roof. It isn't anything close to super insulation, double glaze, low E windows. Um, and that house was about 900 CFM 50 in the blower door. But I know how to use a blower door and and diagnose where the holes are. You know, so so you know, beyond just doing a number, there are things like zonal pressure diagnostics where you um you know open known holes like your attic hatch or a door to the basement, and you can characterize where the leakage is. Um and so for a few hours worth of work, I got my house from 900 to 400, mm. right? So I'm not doing that work for other people. I'm old. I don't like to be in attics anymore. Um, but we could train people to do that work. Yeah. And um, and if you picture a crew, only one person has to know. The other people have to know what to do, have to be told, now you got to go in the attic. You move the insulation away from this location, this location, do this, this, this. And it's not um, it's not exotic work, you know, um, and it's hard work. So we have to pay people a decent wage, a living wage to do it. But I don't know. It's more, uh, you know, I, I'm an engineer. I'm not a social scientist. I would feel better at the end of the day, coming home from making a house more efficient than a day working in, um, I don't know, Walmart or McDonald's. Mm. Like I accomplished something. And I don't know how tangible that is. And I don't know how tangible that is in younger people today, frankly. I don't know. Is that but, enough to uh, make a difference if if we did have a concerted effort to improve the efficiency of our existing housing stock to really move the needle? Would, would that make an appreciable difference in the three-legged yeah. stool you mentioned earlier? Yeah. Yeah. And I think – so So what each house – what each building needs is essentially a roadmap uh, because most people aren't going to do this all at once. They don't have the financial resources. Um, and, and this work – you know, not the low hanging fruit stuff that Brian's talking about, but the real work of making houses way more efficient. It's expensive. And Very. so so you're talking about something that, again, from a societal point of view, maybe we need to reallocate how we spend money in, in, in the country. And that's beyond my ability to change if I don't have a magic wand. But look at what we spend on the military. Look at what we spent bailing out banks a decade ago. That What we spent bailing out banks would have fixed most of the houses in the country. Mm-hmm. A trillion dollars goes a long way. So, um, so 
Yeah, we have to do the low hanging fruit, but every building basically needs a roadmap. And so, um, and, and you know, I, I just recorded a, a course with, uh, with you folks with Fine Home Building. It's going to be a five module course on decarbonizing houses. And uh, what I'm teaching is a process to get there, you know, and, and it's something that I just do over and over again. You know, I'm starting looking at the building. I'm starting looking at the at the energy bills, uh, and I'm looking at where I think the opportunities are. And the thing that's really tough for most homeowners, and I don't think this is any easier for a building professional, by the way, is that they can talk to someone who might be a weatherizing company. They can talk to someone that will put in heat pumps, and they can talk to someone that will put in PVs solar electric. They have no idea how to allocate their investment in each of those three things, right? They're talking to three completely separate vendors. And so the, the, real, uh, the real trick of, of decarbonization is optimizing how far you go on load reduction, because the more you go on load reduction, the more you, first of all, make the cost of the systems and the cost of the renewables smaller, right? Because you're serving a smaller load. But you also, you solve, and I, and I really emphasize this in the class, you solve what are typical deficiencies in almost all houses. They're drafty. They've got insects and rodents. They have frozen pipes. They've got mold. There's just a whole list of things that we put up with in existing houses. And as you do these, even as you start with the low hanging fruit, as Brian said, like you go seal, really do a good job sealing the, the, the rim joist and the sill in a basement or crawl space, frozen pipes gone, right? Cause that's, that's what causes them to freeze. Um, the mice now can't get in. So all these things, um, they're, they, they're interrelated, um, but you need a master plan because you're not going to do them all. But when you are doing a window replacement, well, then you should be thinking about adding insulation to your walls or at least an air barrier. So when I drive around and I see a, a house getting reclad with new windows, an old house with board siding, and you see ripped uh, tar paper flapping in the wind and the the first few uh courses of new shingles or clabbers it's like what are you <laughs> thinking you know for for like a tiny amount of marginal cost you could probably cut the air leakage in the, through that wall by a factor of 10 where are we missing the boat there why is no one think about that why don't contractors make that suggestion to their clients for a little bit more money you could have a much better house where they is don't the disconnect know. They, don't, they know. don't know. Even even um, even client uh, contractors working in high end housing, the the amount the, the ones that really know anything about where energy goes in buildings is is pretty small. And then the other side of the coin, which is our fault as a society, is all the contractors and subs here every day, day in and day out, is cheap, 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 cheap. What's the lowest you can do this for? Mm -hmm. So that you know they're not going to get a proposal the, the person's thinking well if i propose uh doing this with an air barrier you know like you've got you've got board sheathing so maybe i don't know what the cheapest way is probably a breathable um peel and stick membrane over that you know before before the cladding uh instead of tyvek you're going to use a, a vapor open peel and stick um so now uh, one bid is seventy thousand, the other bid is seventy eight, and they take the seventy because the person who know who knows what they're doing and 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 is proposing a better product now they also have to be a marketing genius to be able to sell that or at a minimum an educator, right? You're going to have to teach someone what the issues are, and uh, you know, do folks want to hear that? I don't know. Well, and I yep. wonder too, do we miss, uh, you know, Mark, you've, you've been talking, we've, we've been talking a lot about um, energy uh, consumption and, and carbon, uh, but there's 
there's you, we've also alluded uh, to many other things like healthy indoor air quality, for example, and comfort. And do we are we missing the opportunity to teach people that that there's you know, there's vast benefits to these, this type of work. And when it's done well, you know, it's, it's going to save you money. It's going to save on, on energy. It's going to, um, it's going to be you know, climate positive if you're minimizing, um, embodied carbon and operational carbon, but also you're going to breathe better air in your house. Um, you're going to feel better when you wake up in your, in a bedroom where you were, where you're breathing fresh air all night long and you're going to be more comfortable. Yeah. And, you know, um, there's an engineer up in uh, at Vermont Energy Investment Corporation in Burlington, and I am uh, so sorry because I'm spacing out his name. Young, young engineer, smart, smart guy, and he did a study a few years ago in in a couple of dozen Vermont homes about air quality in bedrooms, and he just measured CO2, carbon dioxide, as a surrogate, but also that you don't really want high CO2 levels, and Overnight, even in houses with HRVs, uh, heat recovery ventilators, the the CO2 level in the bedrooms go way up. I mean, way up. I mean, it was like really, uh, it was really eye-opening data. And um, he got some, you know, he got some coverage of that. Um, so one of the things that I do in my design work is I really try to convince people that they should have a ventilation system, which is now code in Massachusetts, new housing. And uh, that the delivery of fresh air to spaces, particularly bedrooms, is separated from heating and cooling. Mm -hmm. Because if you just dump fresh air into your um, heating and cooling uh, air handler ductwork, when the air handler is not running, it doesn't get out to the bedrooms. Because it's so much less air. It just goes, usually it goes out the return. It's actually where it goes. These are things that we can measure. So now you're uh, either you have to keep your your fan, your central fan going all the time, which is uh, energy use to move that air around. Or my preference is just a separate system that it gets there's teeny ducks that gets fresh air to the bedroom. So my bedroom with two people and a dog in it doesn't get above 800 parts per million of CO2 because I have a verifiable measured amount of fresh air. It gets to my bedroom. Uh, you know, I, you're a New England resident, resident like the rest of us. You know, one of the great things about living in New England is our beautiful old housing stock. One of the criticisms of you know deep energy retrofits or even more modest uh, energy improvements is that uh, we have the chance we might mess up our, the aesthetics of our beautiful houses. And I've heard people say that. The best thing you can do to make a, a building last long time and have people value it is to make it beautiful, make it a wonderful place to be. How do we do that? How do we improve our houses without messing them up? That's a big question. Um, so the strategies for every house is somewhat different. I mean, I think if this became really an industry fixing houses, then there would definitely be categories of types. You know, and um, I don't think you should focus on, like, it's really hard to do Victorians with turrets and things like that. Because you know what? Across the U.S., that is not the dominant housing form. The dominant housing form are ranches and colonials and that type of thing, really. Um, So... uh, yeah, you're pro- it's it's harder if you've got a really complicated house, you know, with lots of jogs and dormers and and turrets and and overhung floors. That's harder, right? But um, I think we're walking away from savings. We're we're letting ourselves off the hook too easy. You know, there was a um, there was a keynote at this year's Building Energy Conference in Boston that really annoyed me. And it was why we stopped doing deep energy retrofits. And it was by a a design build firm uh, who I know pretty well uh, in Newton. And um, I think they were focused on how expensive it was. They really started doing them when the incentive program. Oh, I think it's fair to say, too, that they were uh, focusing on the embodied carbon of these deep energy retrofits. I'm I'm going to totally get to that. 
Um, so, you know, once the incentive programs went, went away, they pretty much stopped doing them because their clients didn't want to spend that money. Interestingly enough, their clientele is a wealthier clientele than, I mean, it's Newton, Massachusetts. Their clientele is pretty well off. So to me, what they really should have said is our clients don't want to spend this money for carbon reduction. That would have been the base on a statement, and I can respect that. I can't sell this to my client. But I want to emphasize that return on investment financially is different than return on investment in terms of carbon. And they're not doing very good math. So um, my house, I gutted. I bought this little house. I gutted it, super insulated it, all new systems, all electric. But it's an existing house. So, you know, I didn't have to add any concrete. I didn't have to add all that much more framing and particularly composites, which are higher embodied carbon. You know, um, OSB has a lot more embodied carbon than wood boards. iJoyce have a lot more embodied carbon than sawn wood, right? So um, I've done a, a fair amount of carbon, embodied carbon calculations, and I was a beta tester for the BEAM tool from Builders for Climate uh, Action. And actually, I just was working with an architect on a project for um, looking for, we've been working together on lower embodied carbon foundations. And I found uh, some errors in the beam tool when I was looking at one of the alternative foundations. So I'm, I'm good at the math part of it, you know? And by the way, calculating embodied carbon is, is something where the accuracy of some of the numbers are not nearly as good as calculating operational energy, right? So, um, because it depends on how clean the grid, you know, if you're using electricity to make this product, how clean is the grid is where you are versus someone making it in another part of even the U.S. Mm -hmm. So th these numbers are a little squishy, but um, I, I did a, a fairly strict calculation for a new house that um, a few years ago. And I took those calculations and I said for my house, let's assume that my house was half that embodied carbon per square foot, my project, which I think is a very conservative calculation because the things that have high embodied carbon, I didn't put on my house. You know, I was working from the inside pretty much. I calculated a four-year carbon payback on my project. That's pretty damn good, don't you think? That's, that's a pretty – so so they totally missed either their math is bad or or I don't know what. But um, it was – to me, it was, it, was, it was a big disservice to the climate crisis that that sort of unpeer-reviewed talk got to be the keynote at an organization that is dedicated to um, energy saving and environmental improvement of the built environment. So – I just think that, uh, yeah, they're, they're expensive, but um, the real issue is they didn't stop doing it because they weren't good carbon investments. They stopped doing them because their clients didn't want to pay for them when they were unsubsidized. Well, that's a good point. How, how do we get folks to care about that? If uh... I'm not a social scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean – uh, people spend money on what they value. Like a Tesla. So, and they think they're helping, right? And, and maybe they are. Well, I think depending on where you live, they are, depending on how clean your grid is. Um, a Tesla Model X, which is the, you know, the one with the gullwing doors and stuff. I did some math at one point. Very, it's very easy to do. In Massachusetts, a Tesla Model X has got like a quarter of the carbon emissions per mile of a Porsche KN, which is sort of the same cost thing. So if we can get as much um, sort of bling factor uh, and social approval of owning the X instead of owning the Porsche, then that's how you change things. Because but people, how do you get someone's house to have that bling? I, I, I think it's reasonable to assume people love beautiful it's what, stuff. It's what you care. You spend money on what you care about. So 
people will spend, you know how much money you guys find home building. You know how much money people will spend on a kitchen remodel. Right? Yeah. People are regularly spending yeah. well into si- up in six figures on improving their house. And, you know, one of the, the, the first uh, zero net energy, deep energy retrofit in Massachusetts was John Livermore's house, um, which I worked on with John. And here's a middle class single dad with two daughters. He's got a raised ranch. Right. Uh, so that that mattered to him. That that was what he cared about. So he didn't change his kitchen or bathroom. He super insulated his house. So um, you spend money on things you that make you feel good. And um, I remember I put the first when I lived in New Hampshire, I had the first grid tied solar PV system in my electric region. And I got interviewed for a magazine about about it. And uh, the woman asked me, what was the, what's the payback? Well, electricity was like 10 or 11 cents a kilowatt hour. This winter here, it went to 41 cents, by the way, on Martha's Vineyard. It was 10 or 11 cents a kilowatt hour, um, you know, in, in the late 90s in New Hampshire. And I said, I think the payback's about 75 years. And she's like, like, why did you do that? And I said, well, you know, I drive a um, Honda Civic and other people drive uh, Mercedes and Lexuses. And I could buy three of my systems for the difference between my Honda and a Mercedes. And how come you're not asking the Mercedes people what the payback of owning a Mercedes is? I'm going to get that on a T-shirt. Right? I mean, what's the payback of the hot tub? What's the payback of the granite countertops? Why is this? Why can't it be legitimate for me to invest in my house in a way that makes me feel good because I'm cutting my carbon footprint? You bought a Mercedes because it makes you feel good somehow, in some way, and I put the money in my house instead. You had a question, Brian, I think. I, I, my, my wheels were just spinning when, it's when, when Mark mentioned the kilowatt hour uh, cost of electricity. Oh, <laughs> in, me too. In Martha's <laughs> Vineyard. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty wild. I mean, it's, 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 I think about half of that here in Connecticut. Yeah. And, and, and our light rates are high. Yeah. yeah. And interestingly, that that is high enough now that um, people, many people are adding or putting PV on their house strictly for the economic benefit of it, because with all the with all the uh, programs for different ways to pay for it, they're just simply paying less a month. Now, you're paying less a month to the PV uh provider than you are to the electric company. And so that's been a shift here. I've been just, I've been watching people who, uh, with all different sort of values, um, Mark, uh, like you pointed to, um, with people with all different values now, just making that choice as a, as a simply a simple, you know, home finance decision, an economic, uh, decision, economic yeah. decision. So, yeah. so when I first in, in the eighties and the early days of my company, half of my clients were, I mean, this was, this was the old style Republican, which we don't have anymore. New Hampshire Republicans who are just conservative. Mm-hmm. They were they were fiscally conservative. Um, and half of my clients were those folks. They just thought they were buying. Um, they were making good investments and they were buying resilience. They understood on a gut level that a house that's that is way um, more efficient in a power outage or an ice storm or whatever is just a better house to be in. And my second house in New Hampshire, which was a more normal house than my first uh, hippie cabin, um, I went away from that house for a month in December 1989, which at the time after that month was the second coldest month on record. And that house just won't freeze. Just won't freeze. Um, So... uh, my clients were all across the political spectrum because they thought it was a good investment. Um, and one of the interesting things about having a country as large as the U.S. 
with different energy sources and costs is that uh, if I wasn't driving our electric car off my roof, you know, if I wasn't, if I didn't have this, I had excess PV energy. So we decided we have to get an electric car because the utility isn't giving me that money. So, so now we're net zero with under five kilowatts, by the way, for the house and a car. But my car, which goes off the island more, is a Honda Fit, and it gets something in the low 40s miles per gallon. At 40 cents a kilowatt hour, running either of those vehicles is about the same. Okay, costs about the same. I just was out last month in Seattle, where my brother lives. They have an electric car. Their electric rates are barely over 10 cents. And they have high gas taxes. So the gas is over five bucks a gallon. So it is an absolute slam dunk cheaper to run an electric car out there. It's not a slam dunk where I live. Mm. So, so all these things can be so regional. We've uh, in the past, I'm sure you'd agree. You mentioned the early like uh, solar movement in the country. We, we tried to reduce uh, plug loads, uh, space heating and cooling needs. There was a big push for uh, solar thermal systems. And I remember, you know, hearing your name in the very early days of my career in this work. We lost our uh, will at a point to do this. It now seems to be coming back to do a better job with uh, improving our, the efficiency of our grid and our homes. Is this going to stick? What what is what is going to be the driver that makes this uh, a priority for us as a nation? I don't know. I mean, you tell me. Do you think that this last year of hurricanes, flooding, wildfires is starting to get people's attention? I mean, you know, uh, how do you get people's attention? I, I really don't know the answer to that, Patrick. I mean, that's. Um, I have actually always done the easy thing, which is work with people who care. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've done a lot of teaching, but the teaching is always with people who had to pay to sign up or, or, or some version of that. Um, you know, the real heroes are the teachers in the public schools who go to go to work every day with a bunch of people that they're supposed to teach who don't really want to be there. So, you know, I, I've taken the easy way out and you can't ask me how I get people that don't care to care. I mean, how do you get people to care about all the inequities in our society beyond climate change? Now, I think climate change, if we don't solve climate change, all the other problems won't be a problem anymore because we won't be here. But, but um so, so that's the one I've been focused on, um, and the other ones, uh, they're real. And how do you get people to really care about that? We uh, are going to talk more about your homes uh, in the podcast after show, and I hope folks who are All Access members will tune in for that. I can't wait. This is going to be my favorite part of the show. Uh, Brian recently built a new home. Uh, I did the blower door test on it and uh, it was, I think the lowest house I've ever tested. Uh, Brian recently put PV on his house and, and that was uh, recently turned on. I want to hear more about how that's going, Brian. And uh, Mark, it's been oh, a delight. Wait a you you have ahead. to tell, you have to tell us what Brian's CFM 50 was. Did we take that? I, I'm going to have to look back at my phone and I'll do that uh, in the, in well, the break Brian's because I took a know. photo. He's like an energy guy, right? <laughs> well, I actually don't remember the CFM 50, but I know that when we did when we did the conversion, it was about 0.5 ACH 50. So um, I'm going to be a, a pedant and a and a annoying person, which is my Oh, sort please. Of we talked about the ex, joy of engineers. Uh, <laughs> I, I really... Brian, I really hate ACH50 because um, it's it's a number that becomes – has a totally different – it's a totally different metric for a tiny house versus Walmart because the amount of enclosure and volume 
to floor area on a small building, it's way harder to get a small building to half an ACH 50 than it is to get Walmart to have. So my my number is always CFM 50 per square foot of shell, you know, and I actually, you know, I was a founding board member of the Passive House Institute of the U.S. And it took me some years and it, it wasn't until they got split from the Germans. But I convinced them that they had to do it in terms of per per unit of enclosure area, not ACH 50 like the Germans. And the U.S. code is ACH 50. It makes no sense. Yeah, you know, the the Army Corps of Engineers test for bigger buildings, you know, for government buildings is CFM, you know, CFM 75 because you need a higher pressure in bigger buildings for square foot. That's what makes sense. But I always like to, you know, when a, a raider tells me it was the tightest building I ever tested, that means nothing to me because the, most buildings suck. You know, they're really bad. My house, my house was 1,100 square feet, built in 2002, and it was over 3,100 CFM 50. That's bananas. That was, well, there were no bananas could fit through the hole. <laughs> <laughs> like, like it would have been hard to get melons through the hole, but I think you could definitely get bananas through. Uh. <laughs> Oh, my God. So we're going to talk more about your house, Brian's house, and the things you're going to teach folks who sign up for your course with uh, Fine Home Building's e-learning program. Oh, my gosh. I think I told you ahead of the show that uh, we have a lot of engineers who listen to the show, and, and uh, uh, I I'm delight that they listen to because it, it tells us that we're doing a pretty good job. And uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I can't wait to continue our conversation. Thanks so much. Well, everybody, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Mark, Brian, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. If you're at all Access member, please stay tuned for the Access, uh, podcast after show, and we're going to talk to Mark more about his house. Uh, please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com, and please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Happy building. Thanks again for listening.